In today's video, I want to talk about GPS and GNSS and what the difference between the two of them is because for a lot of people, especially people who are very new or only use GPS sparingly in their life, whether they be driving to work and they want to have a route to their favorite coffee shop or they're trying to get unlost from a situation they're not supposed to be in, most people refer to navigation technology as GPS when it's not really GPS anymore. And that's where GNSS comes in. And I kind of want to explain what the difference between the two of them are, how they work, and maybe why we should update our terminology a bit to explain what your devices are actually doing and actually use it. Real quick, I'm Nolan from Benchmark and I've had the opportunity to talk to thousands of different surveyors all over the world. And our goal is to help surveyors get the most out of their equipment and start surveying faster. So if you like what you hear in this video, make sure to hit the subscribe button down below or check out our newsletter link in the description. Even though it's only been probably 50, 60 years since GPS was introduced and arguably only 20 years since we've been able to use it in a consumer fashion that everybody has access to this technology. I think we could make a pretty good argument at this point that without GPS and without GNSS technology, our site as we know it would crumble. Those Amazon packages you're tracking, you wouldn't be able to find them. Maybe that coffee shop that I mentioned earlier, you wouldn't be able to get there. I know for a fact, I can't really use a paper map. Of the younger generation, I need that phone to get places. So although the entire world might not completely collapse without GPS, it's definitely changed the way we do things. And I think understanding where we've come from GPS and where we're going with GNSS is an important first step into getting into this GPS technology, whether you be a surveyor or somebody who just might be using it a bit more in your daily life than you did maybe 20 years ago, like I mentioned. Before we get into the difference between GPS and GNSS, I think it's important to understand a couple of things about how these satellites work. And that will give us a little more background on why we have a GNSS system instead of just a GPS system. And what a satellite is doing, and specifically these navigation satellites, is it's sending information via radio waves back down to Earth. And the thing to consider is these satellites are flying at like 20,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. They're moving at several thousand kilometers an hour. They're ripping around up there and they're broadcasting a bunch of information back to the Earth. And that information is specifically two things for our purposes. And that is there's a time code. So what the exact time is down to, I think it's like the nanosecond and also the position of our satellite in orbit because if we have those two pieces of information what we can do is we can triangulate a position and I'll get a little more into that later on when we talk about how these devices work but effectively that's all a GPS satellite is is an incredibly expensive alarm clock there's an atomic clock inside of there that gives us that precise timing information and that is how a satellite in a navigation system works. We kind of understand a very, very general idea of how a satellite works, but what we also need to understand is, as I mentioned, the difference between GPS and GNSS, because there is a big difference. And that is GPS is a global positioning system. It's the original system. And in fact, I have a video on the history of GPS. We'll link to it somewhere on screen, somewhere around here. And what it is, is it's a collection of these navigation satellites. There's about 24 to 32 in orbit, depends on the constellation, and they're flying around the Earth to give global coverage, hence the Global Positioning System acronym. If you're in another country, you probably don't want to rely solely on one nation providing, upkeeping, and maintaining their satellite system. And if you're a burgeoning superpower, you probably also want to have your own just out of national pride, show that you're the best on the world stage. And for that reason, we ended up getting GLONASS. That was the second system to be introduced. It's just GPS, but Russian. So there's some differences. There's some differences in how they're built, how they're programmed, what signals they send. But effectively, there's another 24 to 32 satellites on Earth. They have global coverage. Anybody can use them. And this is a good demonstration on why we want multiple redundant systems. That don't we don't just rely solely on GPS, and that's because as the Soviet Union collapsed, GLONASS has fallen a little bit into disrepair. And believe it or not, I also have a video on GLONASS that I'll link on screen. But we ended up with GLONASS, and then we also had a couple other nations that said, "Well, I don't want to be beholden to two giant world superpowers. I want my own system." We then got Galileo, which the European Union put up. We've got Beidou out of China. India has their own regional system called IRNSS. Japan has their own. There's a whole bunch of different navigation satellites now on Earth, and it's the combination of all of those that make up GNSS. So we don't just have GPS anymore, we also have GNSS, which includes GPS. So to be honest now, it's not as accurate to say you've got a GPS device, arguably more accurate to say I have a GNSS device, which stands for Global Navigation Satellite System and constitutes all of our constellations. So 
We now understand the difference between GPS and GNSS. GNSS is a collection of GPS constellations in effect. Now, why it's important to have multiple redundant systems is because of this. If I have my receiver, I'm down on Earth, we've got a million little satellites flying around in space. I'm gonna draw them as TIE fighters because I'm not very artistically inclined. We've got them here. Now, your receiver has to use a minimum of three to five satellites to calculate a position. Now, what happens if there's something like a building in the way? Well, suddenly this satellite's out of the picture. I can't use that in my solution. If there's a tree over here, this signal isn't gonna be usable. So by having multiple constellations, we're increasing the chance that we're gonna be able to have a satellite that is in position that we're gonna be able to calculate. And what your receiver is doing, and as I mentioned, you need three to five satellites, is it's performing a trilateration calculation. So your receiver knows if I am here on this X and I hear something from a satellite, this satellite must be positioned somewhere around here relative to where I am. Now, one of these isn't gonna be good enough to calculate a position. There's too much uncertainty. If I have two of these, I now have quite a big area of overlap that this could possibly be. But by adding a third, fourth, and fifth, I am shrinking the area. I'm trilaterating my position that it is possible for me to be based on the data that I have. And that is what allows me to calculate a position. Now, with GNSS technology, it was originally developed for the military. It is incredibly useful at positioning weapons. I'm sure all of you have heard of GPS guided bombs. It's very useful if you want to drive a tank through the desert where you don't have many landmarks or roads where you want to go. So this position is purposefully degraded by the military. The military is able to get within a couple of centimeters, no problem. They don't need any extra equipment. They're able to just do whatever they want. However, if you're a civilian, you're not able to use these signals. So this trilateration is only ever going to give you a position that is accurate to within 0.5-ish meters and that is dependent on what satellite constellations are available in your area. Are there SBAS systems, which we'll make a video on another day? What is the coverage available for your device in your area? Now, what if I want more accurate than that? Because obviously we sell survey equipment here. I sell equipment that I claim is able to get a centimeter accurate position. If I can only get 0.5 meters out of my GNSS signals, I'm obviously lying to you, correct? Well, no. I'm not lying to you. What you need is a base and rover system. And what that means is you take two of these devices that are able to get 0.5 meters. And by comparing the solution between the two of them, you can do something called real-time kinematic measurements. And by comparing what this receiver sees and this receiver sees, we're able to calculate a position not to within a half a meter, but to within a centimeter anywhere on the earth. And this is what has allowed surveyors to kind of ditch their optical total stations and theodolites and really begin to embrace this GNSS revolution that we've seen in the industry. So with all of that in mind, I've given you a rough accuracy. You've got 0.5 meters, you've got a centimeter, but what can you actually use this equipment for beyond just navigating to the coffee shop or finding your way home after a night out? And that is, there are a whole bunch of applications that go beyond just basic navigation. As I kind of already alluded to, we can use these GPS positioning devices to get within a centimeter this is obviously super useful if you're doing something like surveying because you can get boundaries and property corners lay out fences put in buildings all of that kind of fun stuff but it's not just for surveyors and it's not just for the basic application of getting from place to place you can also use this positioning technology let's say you're a dirt or earth contractor you can use this to position your equipment you can use this to do grades cuts and fills without having to bring in a surveyor you can have it right on your machines if you're somebody who's doing hydrographic surveys you can use it for vehicle positioning. You can use it to keep your boat in place when you're doing a drilling operation. Maybe you are putting boreholes in. All of these kind of things can use GPS. Now, those are only the positioning applications for GPS and GNSS. Another really common one that maybe doesn't get as much notoriety, but is arguably more important than finding your way to and from a location is the timing applications that we use GPS and GNSS for. Just about the whole internet actually relies on timing, keeping servers in sync with one another. A lot of the time they're using GPS timing because it's the most accurate positioning available 
across the entire globe. A lot of hospitals use it for things like MRI machines or where you need incredibly precise timing. You actually have GPS technology integrated because that time code helps keep everything in sync and you know you can always rely on it. So it's not just positioning that GPS is used for. It's kind of used for almost everything in your day-to-day -day life, even if you're not fully aware of it. So what else can we do with GPS and GNSS? going forward in the future here. And that's a great question because it really does seem like we've reached the pinnacle of it, but there's still a lot of things we can do to improve GPS and GNSS technology just in the last five years. So, you know, I've been working here since 2017. Since the time I started to now, we've seen like fundamental changes in GPS and Beidou constellations, specifically where they've gotten fundamentally new signals that have completely changed the way we're able to use the RTK equipment, whether it be under trees, near buildings, that kind of thing. But also things like Galileo or energy producing new civilian signals that instead of that half meter accuracy I mentioned, they're going to give you 10 centimeters for free anywhere on earth. That, that's going to change the game on how we do GIS and basic mapping applications. And then on top of that, you know, is, you know, hopefully we begin to explore outwards in our solar system. Maybe we'll start to see GPS systems on places like Mars or the moon, because we know if you follow space news at all, it can be really difficult to see to the backside of the moon. How do we get signals back and forth? Are we going to need navigation? on the moon if we begin to colonize it? Who knows? And hopefully we'll be around to see it. But for now, that's everything in today's video.